Welcome to the KSO Show. I am Mason Both That is Derek Young. We are here ready to preview K-State West Virginia as the Wildcats make their first trip to Morgantown in a couple of seasons and also first time they get to play West Virginia in, in two years because they did not play last year and that's going to become the norm now moving forward in the Big 12. K-State will not see West Virginia next year. They will see West Virginia at home again then in the 2026 season because of the way that the Big 12 scheduling works out. So uh, get used to all these opponents that it took probably 12, 13 years to get used to playing on a constant basis. Well, now K-State doesn't play TCU this year, and they're not going to play West Virginia next year. So it's kind of interesting to see how that all works out. But the Wildcats get ready to go on the road to Morgantown in a lot of ways a very similar game to what they just played this past weekend against Colorado. Night game, obviously little bit earlier in the day by three hours fortunately so that's a good thing but West Virginia is kind of this team where maybe the unknowns are starting to become a little bit more known after their loss to Iowa State last week but they still pose a significant threat of some kind of K-State and they they have enough going into this game that would probably make you a little bit uneasy if you're a K-State fan so just off the top D.Y. what is uh, uh the number one or number two thing that you're uh, watching for in this game with K-State and West Virginia? Yeah, one, it's interesting, the dynamic of this game and what it means to each team. Like, what? <laughs> excuse me, West Virginia, their fans are pretty down in the dumps because to them it seems like every time they play a team with a pulse, they lose. And they take care of business when they're the better team, but when they get that kind of spotlight game, they kind of fall flat. So this is another opportunity. The fans certainly don't have any confidence, but I do think the team itself probably still has some fight in them. I don't think the quit factor is is a factor in this one. West Virginia wins, and they got they knocked Kansas State basically out of contention for for at least the foreseeable future, and have plenty of opportunities available to them the rest of the way. So, even though they are three and three, two of those losses are in the non-con to Penn State and Pittsburgh. A win here just for the Big 12 title race would be significant for the Mountaineers, and they feel like they're playing through something the rest of the year. So even though the fans are kind of teetering and don't have a ton of confidence or faith in the Mountaineers at this point, I think the team itself will still have a lot of fight. And I also believe I I don't think anything of their defense, I'll be quite honest, but they could score. And, and they could play some offense. So the threat that they that the the threat that they pose is that they have an ability to score quite a few points. The interesting thing is, is that the, these are the two worst pass defenses in the Big Twelve, and it's not really close. But neither one really wants to rely on the passing game. Yeah, and the other th yeah, Gar Garrett Green's running ability to me is probably the biggest wild card in this game. Uh, so that's probably where the most concern would come from in this, but you talk about West Virginia and yeah, things, they don't feel like they're in a very good spot there. People are not happy with Neil Brown. I saw earlier today, some guy started to go fund me. He's trying to uh, buy one of those planes that flies around with a banner and has some message on it. And it, it's, it, they want to fire Neil Brown on there, yeah. uh, which is funny, but if West Virginia pulls off this win, they're obviously two and one in big 12 play. Their next four games are very manageable in terms of who they play, Arizona is disappointing. Cincinnati, that's a gettable game on the road. And then home games with Baylor and UCF. And you could be looking at a big final week matchup at Texas Tech. And I know that that's probably not the mo most realistic thing, but it is a scenario that could possibly happen. And it's it's interesting to see West Virginia jump off so hard. And I, I almost wonder if this wouldn't be the case if they didn't have that bad loss to Pitt where they blew the yep. lead. And if they're four and two right now and you beat Pitt, you feel a lot differently about this, but you're sitting at three and three. You didn't have much fight against Iowa State. And I think everybody's kind of starting to check out on West Virginia football. It's just a matter of if the team's actually at that point. I don't, I guess this is sort of another loser leaves town type of game. You could say, although K-State is, is a good enough team that even at five and two, I'm not calling them a loser, uh, someone that would be in a loser leaves town game. So it just makes their big 12 title chances 
minuscule because of the amount of teams that would still be ahead of them at that point. And, you know, Iowa State, they play UCF at home. Pretty simple game. BYU, they play – who? Uh, I'm going to draw a blank here. BYU, their, their home game this week is against Oklahoma State. So should be a rather simple game. And then you got to think it, with Texas Tech, their next two games are against TCU and Baylor. Texas Tech still undefeated in the Big 12. So the weird thing about it is K-State is doing well, but they're almost still backs against the wall because Texas Tech, BYU, and Iowa State have had their schedule open up so well for them. And Kansas State's schedule has been so much probably a little bit more challenging than all three of them that Kansas State's like, we just got to keep winning against no team really in the bottom of the league just to catch up. So I wouldn't put Kansas State in that scenario. What I would say is, though, this does feel like a crossroads game for West Virginia. A loss, the fans are out even more. You're only 500 in the Big Ten, or in the Big 12, sorry. And then you got gettable games but losable games coming up too where it can really get away from you fast. So for me, this game will probably dictate the direction of the rest of the season for West Virginia. You're you're muted. This is one too where I think about for West Virginia, I mean if if they lose this game, like do you try to use this as your avenue to get off of the Neil Brown thing? Because like I said, those next four games become manageable. It's it's kind of like the Matt Wells situation at Texas Tech in 2021 where they lost that game to K-State and they're like, okay, we better jump ship now because we're, we're probably going to win some games coming up here. And they did that. Um, what, uh, West Virginia is one of those teams that Neil Brown winning games last year with a manageable schedule put them in kind of a tough spot. And now he's in kind of this – class of guys like Gus Malzahn uh, that got contract extensions that you're probably thinking, I wish we wouldn't have done that, but you Brent did. Venable, Brent Venables too. Yeah. yeah. Not, not in the big 12, but another, and, and something to think about too, if you're West Virginia, yeah, you, you're, you're three wins, right? You, three, your three losses. You're like, look, all three of our losses to run undefeated teams, but you, but your wins are against Oklahoma state, KU and Albany. Yeah, your wins are against teams that uh, I'm not sure they have. Well, we know that the two Big 12 teams don't have conference wins yet, and uh, I haven't checked in to see how Albany is managing the Colonial Athletic Association, um, but I'm going to guess not very well. Um, So I because Albany's three and three this season. So okay. uh, seeing what you get out of West Virginia this weekend is going to be interesting. And again, this just feels like to me, another one of those games for K state that they can go out and they can just get the the quick two score lead early in the game. You can probably just kind of coast from there um, because you can kind of take the will out of the game from the opponent, but West Virginia, obviously like the players are still going to fight. Like when you get up there and, and you're playing, like everybody's ready to go. So I don't think if you get into this thing and it's close in the third quarter, you're going to be able to pull away from West Virginia unless you make some serious stuff happen. You just can't give them the power of belief. Yeah, I would agree. And look, I'll be honest. I, I think they're getting West Virginia's best shot this weekend. I don't think it's, I, I think it would be a little surprising to me if the Mountaineers didn't play one of their best games of the season. I don't know if I'm at that point, but. Uh, at least we've got both sides of the coin covered here where DY's giving West Virginia loads of respect and worried about the cats. And I'm just kind of like, eh, I'm interested to see what happens here, but I think K-State should be able to manage this thing. From a matchup standpoint, it does come out pretty well for K-State. They're, they're running the ball they're they're in with explosiveness. They're starting to pass the ball with a little bit of explosiveness and West Virginia just gives up yards and droves right now. Um, so you like, kind of like what the offense will be able to do, but can West Virginia take away the run game a little bit? Stats say that they're a better run defense than a pass defense, but I mean it hasn't really mattered to K State if you're a good run defense or not. They're going to run the ball anyways. On the flip side, West Virginia wants to run the ball. Nobody's run the ball in K State this year. They, they, I believe, they still have the number one run defense in the Big Twelve, and it's been so good that everyone just keeps abandoning the run even in the first half. What is I think the number is 60% of offensive plays against K-State have been passes. 
just because everyone's like, oh, the, the rent's not working. Yeah, uh, if you go and look at it, K State averaging two and a half yards a carry this year. Uh, their defense is giving up seventy one point <laughs> seven yards a game, uh, and then the next closest in the Big Twelve is UCF, and they're twenty yards per game behind K State. There, West Virginia, for reference, they're sixth in the Big Twelve right now and run defense at one hundred thirty yards a game and three point six yards a carry. Yeah, uh, Colorado but, was Colorado probably had a better run defense. Yeah, but if another thing to, to look around at this too is Teams still kind of keep pelting West Virginia with the run. They're not like abandoning it like you're talking about because uh, West Virginia is is six most rush attempts against them in the league. K-State second least amount of rushing attempts against them uh, with 170. UCF has only had teams run the ball 169 times against them. That might have something more to do with UCF's pass defense and uh, or, or their ability K- to get the play. But K- K-State's pass defense too might have something yeah, to do with it. Let's be honest. True, I, I think some of it is like the teams that UCF has played too, right? Uh, they were up three. T- they were up three touchdowns on TCU. TCU was always already going to be pass heavy. They get down twenty one points. Uh, oh, actually, UCF was the one down twenty one points, so it actually should have been backwards there. So that's kind of weird. But TCU just they, they don't yeah, want to. TCU does want to run the ball. Yeah, Josh <laughs> Hoover wants to throw it a thousand times. So yeah, it's it, it's one of those things. No, now in terms of K State's passing game, because. Obviously, a little bit better uh, last weekend against Colorado, and probably more so because everybody will remember the final drive and and the pass to uh, Avery from Avery Johnson to Chase Brown. Where do you feel about K State's passing game right now? Because I, if you look at it, they're averaging right around 190 yards passing a game. I think that's going to continue to go up throughout the course of the season, but. This is really right around where K-State is going to be. I don't know that it's necessarily a lack of being able to throw the ball. It's because their run game is so good. But they showed last week that they can exploit a bad pass defense when the opportunity is given. Do you think they can do that again this weekend against West Virginia? I do, yeah. As long as like the, the environment doesn't get to them and they don't really go mistake after mistake and let it snowball on them like you did Provo because road games do invite kind of different kind of games sometimes than what you are expecting. But this is an improving passing offense just about every week. And one that's gotten a little bit more explosive week after week as well, because they've really found something, in my opinion. Whether it's with the running backs or with Jace Brown, Jace Brown that that has really took off. And this is a West Virginia team that just gives up chunk pass plays like it's nobody's business. Like they're I believe their passing explosiveness is the worst in the country. I believe it is 134 out of 134 teams hard to do they've done it so uh, the only pass defense efficiency that is worse than k-state in the big 12 as well so uh, the success rate i think is like 110th in the country like they can't stop the pass but so i i think kids they'll be able to exploit it my thing is if you're k-state you still want to stay true to who you are so i i don't know that they're going to be like, well, West Virginia can't pass. So we're going to go 70% pass. I don't think it'll be anything like that. Well, so then where, where do you envision the role for DJ Giddens and, and Dylan Edwards being in the run game? And then also to some extent uh, where Avery Johnson's legs play into this after he, it was taken away from him in the second half last week in Boulder. Now the Russian explosiveness against West Virginia has been pretty effective too. Let's let's not get it twisted. Um, their pass defense is really, really bad, but the run defense is is not that much better. My guess would be we have, they'll have to rely a little bit more on DJ and Dylan, just because I don't know that we can feel confident going into this. Like how quickly are they able to go back to Avery Johnson's legs? Cause they couldn't in the second half against Colorado after his injury. So I think that plays a role. Uh, and maybe you don't want to unload that unless you have to. So maybe they play it by ear. If you get to the second half and it's kind of a tight game and you, you kind of need that extra layer uh, of a danger to give West Virginia, then maybe you go to it that, that point. But maybe I would hold it back. If you can, I would hold it back. I think especially you got KU. You can't think like this. If you're the K-State coaches, I get it, but you got KU the next week and, and I get that KU is one of five, but you're going to get the best version of KU as well. And it's not like they're getting blown out either. 
Yes, correct. And I would also look at it this way. Number one, I, based on the nature of how Avery Johnson talked about the injury against Colorado, it would seem like to me it's not something that has long-term effects. Um, but I don't think you need to press it when you look around and you say, we obviously have DJ Giddens. He can get it done. Dylan Edwards can be explosive running the football. And then in the passing game, you feel better about it based off what you've seen the last two weeks and how K-State's been able to execute. Uh, and, and you should trust Avery Johnson as a passer more. So I think you have a, a long line of things to get to before you you would think you need to rely or, or go too heavily. Avery Johnson running the football, I, I think this is one of those games where maybe similar to Oklahoma State, he ended that game with only five carries for 60 yards. I could envision something like that where it's we have explicit moments that call for the Avery Johnson run. Let's capitalize on it right here. But this is not going to be going to it 10 times throughout the course of the game. I think it's just like a if we can if we can get this on them, we're going to do it to take advantage of it. We're not going to constantly need it because I don't think K-State does. I think it's it, DJ Gins is going to continue to be a stud even against good defenses. And as you already covered, West Virginia, they're still giving up explosive runs. Um, I mean, Iowa State just had a guy play running back that I'm not sure he touched a ball in his entire life. And he averaged almost five yards a carry against them last week. So they can do that. And then like I said, I trust I trust Avery Johnson throwing the football a lot more now, and Jace Brown is obviously a reliable target, and we'll see how everybody else does stepping up in that department. Nope, can't, I can't disagree with any of that. All right, uh, a couple other questions regarding K-State and the road trip to West Virginia. We talked before the season that if you were looking for a tricky part of the schedule, it would probably be right now because, and this again, this was before the season when we thought that basically the entire last month and a half season was going to be against bad teams and Iowa state that now seems to be kind of turning around because Arizona state and Cincinnati are a little bit friskier than anticipated. Um, but do you still anticipate there being any troubles with the late game in Boulder last week, different time zone, and now the six thirty game, different time zone this week in West Virginia and back-to-back -back road games and everything that goes into it? Yes, because I think they still have enough youth and inexperience on this team where it can come into play. I really do. Where do you think the – I mean, is that just an Avery Johnson thing or is that elsewhere that you have that concern? That, that's basically your entire offense that has a bunch of first-year contributors. I think it's always in play, uh, a letdown spot. I, I, don't, I think Kansas State is a team the way that they are composed in terms of age and experience, especially on the offensive side of the ball where they are vulnerable to positions like this. Yeah, I, I, I could see it. I think it's going to be interesting to see probably more so than anything to me, how the defense responds. I, the offense, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable uh, with the way that things are playing out. So I'll be interested to uh, follow along with how things end up going. It, with. And in terms of the schedule, you're right. We thought like K-State would get this like simple of a schedule. Now, because we thought they were playing the four worst teams. According to our power rankings, the bottom six, 11 through 16, K-State's only getting half of those teams. They, they, That's it. Uh, so that means they're getting basically the top 10 of the league, uh, you know, seven or, or six of the top 10 of the league. That's quite a bit. And you have to think, one of those who you already put behind you in Oklahoma State, you're probably going to get Houston at a time where they're playing some of their best football this year because you're playing them late. And the other one being Kansas, and they'll probably play better against you than they will anyone else on their schedule. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, we will take a pause here and talk about Cats to Ireland real quick. Then we'll do best bets and get into the Big 12 and then uh, our game MVPs and everything else stemming from that. So let's talk about it. Cats to Ireland right now. What better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland? The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there's a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So uh, everybody jump on that real quick if you want to be there for, again, what could be the third Farmageddon game in a six-month period, and 
Think about all the stakes that are attached or could be attached to this year's Farmageddon game at the end of the season and realize that all those same things very well could, could be true next year when the teams play. It's just going to happen in week zero, which is a wild thing to think about, that a game that play, is played in week zero could have as much weight as it does in determining the Big 12 champ next year because K-State and Iowa State are going to have a lot of the same players uh, that are determining what their outcome of the 2024 season is in 2025 next year. Yeah, there's a chance preseason one and two in the Big 12 could be these two teams. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye on it as uh, the, the race continues throughout this season and then obviously in the buildup to next year. Time for best bets now. Look around the rest of college football. Uh, once again, last week, not a, not a great week. One and two for the both of us, where I think the two picks that we both like the most – uh, they they happened. Uh, mine not as easy as yours, although I did want to take Iowa, but I I left it to you. Uh, they handled business easily, and then Kentucky just decided to flat out get beat, uh, which is never fun. And then Pitt uh, basically led by two points the last fifteen minutes of the game and couldn't do anything to add on to it. OU about it's what I thought could happen to them, uh, but. Again, there were a lot of others out there that I think were tailing the historic side of this. We just got the, hey, you know, every like six years, somebody just beats the snot out of somebody. It's and not it every, <laughs> It's not every six years. It's just whenever Brent Venables is involved. Because in, in the three times he's played Texas, two of the lot, his two losses are 49 to zero and 34 to three. Yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Uh, and then Rocco backed. He took a sack early in the game against West Virginia. He ended the game with zero rushing yards. Um, if he hadn't, I, I need to go see just how much sack yardage he lost. But uh, if he doesn't take that sack, I'm pretty sure it happens. So again, I was getting very, as you know, the the Healer family would say in Bluey, I was getting cheeky with that one. But uh, I I wanted something different, and that one. Would have been very electric to see it actually come through. So I may have to, I might have to continue to explore the Rocco Beck rushing totals because uh, I, I like those really low numbers. It, it adds a lot of fun and intrigue to the game. Yeah, it's kind of like my Michigan ones last year. I think when they were playing Indiana, yeah. I, the way it played out, I would do my pit pick over again. I think that I th I still think I was on the right side. Um, just unfortunate there. I was totally wrong, Kentucky. Uh, time to stop fading Vanderbilt. They might actually be solid. Well, and Kentucky probably just needs to figure out how they're what they're going to do on a week to week basis. Be a little bit more consistent, maybe. That'd be my advice to the to the Blue Wildcats down there. All right, this week uh, there's some Big Twelve flair. We got some SEC. We got some Big Ten. Actually, I'm looking at it now. All a cart. We each of us have a Big Ten game, an SEC game, and a Big Twelve game. So here is uh, the picks of the week from DY and I, and I, you had KU six and a half. They were down to four and a half this morning when I was okay. looking for my lines. So I'm giving the four and a half to you right there. Uh, although I guess if you want to tease it up to six and a half and get a, a little extra cash, that's what DY thinks could happen. Uh, but I'll let you lead off here with your picks. Yeah, it's probably not wise to pick Kansas to cover almost a touchdown this year. Uh, in any game, uh, obviously, I'm getting at four and a half. They are zero and six up. against the spread this year. But this just, and I get Willie Fritz will probably be up for this game when he plays the Kansas schools. I'm sure that's going to mean something more to him. And it's not like there's going to be a raucous home field advantage. It's going to be at Arrowhead Stadium. I get all of that. With that being said, Kansas is one in five, and I know it sounds stupid. But they are not a bad one and five team. They are a stupid one and five team. I'll put it that way. They are very stupid. But this is probably the worst team of those five, a worse team than the five losses they have. So as long as they play the way they did in those other five games and don't do stupid, you know what, late, I think it's an easy cover, to be quite honest. And then Michigan, Illinois, that's kind of my rule of thumb there also. 43 and a half seems way too high for teams that want to go slow and want to run the ball and two teams that have really, really good defenses as well. I'm surprised the number is as high as it is. It's kind of a weird number to me, which means it'll probably go over. But logic says under 43 and a half between Michigan and Illinois, Georgia three and a half, uh, taking a risk there. I get it. But Texas is like the last team left this year that hasn't had somewhat of a clunker, right? Because even Oregon early in the season had clunkers when they were playing 
Boise State and Idaho, right? Texas hasn't had that yet. And this will be the hungriest that Georgia is. I think this is a pride game. That's why I like the dogs. Looking at the uh, individual team totals in Michigan, Illinois, it had Illinois at 20 and a half and it had Michigan at 24 and a half. I just I don't know that I see a world where Michigan scores 24 points. Like that's tough to envision to me because Illinois' defense has, until the Purdue game, yeah. Been really the the best thing for him. I the have no half, idea what second half Purdue. Then. Yeah, second yeah. half Purdue. That was a mess. Michigan, I'm, and the way that here's something to think about though. It'll make the game go faster. But even if they were to pass the ball, I mean, the pass rush from these teams should make it passing near impossible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the fact that Michigan has quarterbacks that don't have arms, um, so that's that makes it a little tricky as well. All right, for my SEC game, I'm taking Alabama minus the two and a half against Tennessee. Alabama's looked obviously very wonky the last couple of weeks. So this is kind of a get right, prove yourself type of deal. It's also a Tennessee has looked like dog crap. And if you're going to look at both of these teams going on courses of the last couple of weeks, struggling, not playing to their potential, I'm going to have more faith in the team that has enough key pieces and better playmakers from a team a season ago, even though obviously new coaching staff, all that stuff. The other one, I'm taking Nebraska plus six and a half on the road at Indiana uh, because like Indiana's been a, a great story this year. Obviously, Signetti has a great thing going. I think they that is a sustained thing that Indiana can be, but I don't think they're quite as good as the six and zero record would indicate. And Nebraska, I think just, you know, the overtime loss to Illinois, not being seen for a little bit, they played some ugly football against Purdue. Uh, and then they had a bye week. Um, I think that this has kind of been an out of sight, out of mind thing, but Nebraska is probably worth circling back around to. So I'll take the Huskers plus the six and a half. And then, you know, I, there's a chance that Oklahoma state does something crazy, but the more I thought about it, they kind of suck this year and it has not gotten any better with the fact that Mike Gundy is going to play quarterbacks that don't have a ton of experience. And now that I know what that environment at Lavelle Edwards stadium is like in a night game, and they're going to play their nine 15 Friday night. I don't see any way Oklahoma state keeps that game within 10 points. I think BYU and that crowd eats the, the fresh quarterbacks alive. Uh, so I am taking the Cougars on Friday night, minus nine and a half. I agree with that logic, uh, but I just I get a little bit scared when the logic looks that obvious with Mike Gundy. Well, yeah, and uh, again, this comes back to BYU and and Iowa State. You look around the rest of the Big Twelve at some point in Texas Tech now because they're three and zero in Big Twelve. Play. At some point, those teams are going to stumble and have a bad game. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a matter of when it happens. It's you're right. The Mike Gundy aspect is concerning, but it is also tough to see that happening at home for BYU. It, it, it makes it sense. So it, bad. It's like the most obvious cover of the week. BYU only lay nine and a half against Oklahoma State at home, but it seems so obvious. I was terrified of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand that. Uh, all right. What is your your favorite from the K-State West Virginia game here this weekend? I believe I, I set under 55 just mm -hmm. because, again, you have two teams that want to run the ball. If it goes over, it's because the pass defenses are so bad that the teams choose to pass it. Yeah, well, I'm I'm thinking that that uh, won't happen, but we'll see how it ends up uh, playing out over the course of this game. For me, I am going to go with, and this maybe this is silly too, but there's been all this talk and thought about oh, he's not getting the touchdowns that he needs. I'm taking DJ Giddens yeah. plus 200 for two touchdowns in the game um, because I do think at some point the staff will become acutely aware of that. And look, they tried to get him a score right down there last week and then they gave it to him, but he didn't really get in. So they, he just converted the fourth down and then or the third down. And then the rest somehow on the replay decided not only did he not get in the end zone, that he was also he didn't get the first down, which was wild. So he had to then get it. Uh, and they went with the pass play then to find the, the end zone. I think they give DJ Giddens the ball uh, close to the goal line. He's able to score two touchdowns this week. So especially when you talk about bad pass defense, and we know that DJ Giddens, as long as he catches the ball, which is sometimes uh, a question mark, 
he's the king of just being left wide, wide, wide open by teams. So uh, DJ Giddens, two touchdowns this week in Morgantown is my play there. I like it. All right. Uh, it'd be nice if the 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 books kind of realized that DJ Giddens wasn't scoring touchdowns in general, though, and they wanted to make that number a little bit higher. But, you know, that's how it goes. I, I think if you're – if you want to try and do something really crazy in this game, it's probably just pick a random K-State receiver uh, that you think could possibly catch a touchdown. Uh, like Jaden Jackson is plus 380, I see. That would be one of those that if you just are throwing something out there and you're like, ah, I'll put $10 on it or something, uh, Jaden Jackson might be the guy. Because if the pass defenses are this bad, somebody random is going to find the end zone on Saturday. Or, or Jace Brown, two touchdowns is the way to go. Because, again, yeah. you're right. Plus 200 is not the best odds for a two-touchdown DJ Giddens Day, considering what he's done so far. Yeah, so we'll see. Although, it do we really think Jace Brown has back-to-back two-touchdown games in him? I'm not sure that's legal I, I, at K-State. I, I, I get that. Avery and him have such a rapport, and yeah. he is cooking so well right now. I, I wouldn't doubt it. All right, let's move on. Big 12 scoreboard time. Talk about what's coming up in the Big 12 this weekend. Uh, Bye weeks on pause for at least a little bit. So it is a full slate of Big 12 games this weekend. Eight games throughout the league. They are all league-on-league matchups. And it all starts Friday night. Oklahoma State, BYU. We talked about it a little bit. Obviously, I'm rolling with the Cougs. That seems to be where you're going as well, but a little bit of concern just given the fact that uh, Mike Gundy being held down for this long seems kind of strange and unlikely. Yeah, I'd go Cougs, but that has Mike Gundy special written all over it, technically. Yeah, yeah, it does. It definitely does. Uh, And then when you get to the first wave of games on Saturday, Arizona State, Cincinnati, probably, I mean, I'll watch it because I got to support my man Gabe and the Sun Devils, and I've been all over Arizona State uh, this year, but not many people will probably watch Arizona State Cincinnati. I their team, the only problem is now they're going to have to do it without Sam Levitt because he got banged up against Utah. So they're starting uh, Georgia Tech and Nebraska transfer Jeff Sims, which could be scary. Cincinnati might be able to put up a, a little bit of a fight and, and once again win a Big 12 game when it doesn't look like they, they should be doing much. Yeah, Arizona State's going to even be more one-dimensional than they have been this year. And on the road, cross-country trip, Cincinnati something to play yeah. for. I kind of think the Bearcats are in a good spot there. Uh, that. Here's here's a question. Would you rather be K-State playing the 9.30 p.m. Central Time kick or Arizona State playing the 9 a.m. Arizona Time kick? Yeah, probably the morning one. I, I know it depends what your health is. If your health, if you need another day of recovery, then that's probably problematic. But if you're fairly healthy, I think you'd like to get the game out of the way. Uh, one that I know a lot of people will be interested in seeing the outcome: Houston at KU in Kansas City Arrowhead Stadium. You know my uh, thoughts. Yep. I know. Yeah, we know Dy. He's rolling with the Jayhawks. Look, to me, this is one of those deals where, I, similar to Oklahoma State, and not ne- O State's got the longer, drawn-out history here, obviously, because Gundy's been around for a long time. But KU has all this talent that should make them worlds better than Houston. The only wild card in this is Houston is coming off their bye week, and before that, they got that win against TCU, and they started Zayon Chris at quarterback He's instead of Donovan Smith. He's fun. He's fun to watch. Too. Yeah, so is that the wild card in Houston? It could be. And, again, I always go back to these teams at the end of the day, they tell you who they are by how they play, and there's a chance that KU is telling us all along here that this is just what they're going to be all season so yeah but are, are they really going to lose like that every single game at one point they're going to win and pull away you would think yeah yeah we'll Across see nine games yeah uh, we'll see yeah all right uh next up on the big 12 schedule then for week eight colorado at arizona this Fun is game. a th- these next two are probably my favorite two games of the weekend because of uh just the uncertainty that could come out of them but colorado on the road at arizona believe arizona is a three and a half point favorite last i saw and i would just go colorado because i trust them more arizona you cannot trust them at all like when they lose, they really lose. And the only time they really got up for a win was against the Utah team that doesn't look like they're any good. Yeah, I 
I flirted with Colorado going on best bets, but there is a world like Arizona still kind of concerns me because I think that there's a good team lurking around there and they might show up at one point, but uh, they're getting closer and closer to like that KU category of you've shown me who you are. I'm, I'm going to be out on you. And then Baylor, Texas tech, another one I consider because I like Baylor plus the six and a half here uh, because ever since Sawyer Robertson took over at quarterback, I think there's been a little bit more juice to the bears, Texas tech. I think the record looks better than how they've actually played, even though they've been, better over the last probably three weeks of the season. This is going to be a fascinating game in Lubbock because this is probably the uh, are you a contender or pretender game for Texas Tech. I agree. I I think there's only two outcomes here. I think a Baylor win, like an upset in Lubbock is on the table. But if not, I can see the Red Raiders just blowing them off the field. Uh, like too. 21, yeah. 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 Uh, I've been watching a lot of Baylor-Texas Tech games uh, of yesteryear on the Big 12 Fast channel today. So I saw the 9 and 2010 games. Uh, always fun to look back at that. Joel Myers, Dave Lapham on the call. Um, it didn't really give me anything for this other than the fact that I saw Texas Tech beat Baylor in the 2010 game today. And I just, again, shout out to the Big 12 for doing that new streaming channel and just throwing random old games up there. Um, I think some point on Saturday, I saw they're going to show the 2022 K-State KU game for anybody interested in that. Uh, K-State, West Virginia, obviously, we'll talk more about that here in just a second. Last two games of the night, though, in the Big 12, UCF and Iowa State kick at the same time as K-State, West Virginia. And then TCU gets the late night experience in Salt Lake City. Uh, I think Iowa State probably handles UCF pretty easily because I think UCF is a team to be out on right now. And the TCU-Utah is kind of fascinating. Like, I don't think TCU is a good team, but now that Cam Rising's out, Utah hasn't looked like a world beater with Cam Rising's absence and having the backup quarterbacks play. But that experience and being at home probably helps Isaac Wilson and the Utes get over the top and win by, I don't know, 10 to 14 points. I could see Iowa State sleepwalk a little bit. Uh, and it probably won't matter because UCF is that bad. Yeah. So, but uh, that, that's how I see that. And the final game, TCU Utah. Utah because they are Utah. They still play defense. They could probably stop the TCU offense, and not many teams actually have, to be quite honest. And TCU ain't stopping nobody. They probably can't stop Isaac Wilson. Let's be honest. Like it would not surprise me, despite how Utah has played, that they just kicked the crap out of TCU because I think the Frogs are that bad. I think. Before it's all said and done, you know, when we do our Big 12 power rankings, that number 16 spot, that coveted number 16 spot, that final one, I think it might be the Frogs by the end of the year. Yeah, I think that might be uh, not a bad bet. And because <laughs> TCU, as I look at it, uh, through their, uh, what, they've played six games now, Josh Hoover's only thrown six interceptions this season. That number is likely to go up. Uh, he was a pretty turnover-prone quarterback last season. Also, when you so. throw it, when you throw it that much, that it's just going to happen. Like, they, don't they throw? Mm -hmm. They throw like fifty times a game. Like, come on. Yeah, uh, let's see here if I can do a uh, quick math. So, through the first six games of the season, uh, they're averaging almost forty attempts per game at passing the football. So. Not anything special uh, there in terms of limiting that and trying to run the football. So that is the look around the Big 12 this weekend. And we'll get back into talking K-State, West Virginia, because the Cats have a big one with the Mountaineers this weekend in Morgantown. Uh, if K-State comes out on top in this game, who are your game MVPs on offense and defense? I, I kind of gave a hint earlier. I think Jace Brown. I think the passing explosiveness is something that can be exploited against West Virginia. Jaden Jackson, he'll play, but remember he got banged up a little bit last week. I think Chris Kleiman said mm -hmm. Keegan Johnson entered the game a little banged up. Uh, Jace Brown's been the source of the passing explosiveness. He should get more and more targets. I'll go Jace Brown offensively. Uh, defensively a little bit harder uh but west virginia is going to run the ball a lot so give me damian Eli leo he's he's oh. been a run stuffer for the wildcats this year i think that that has to be your answer on that front he stoned the colorado run game almost single-handedly and you know what do we do, do we do special teams you know special teams you're guy? a special teams guy out there so yeah i don't I'm, ty bowman you know, no, I, I, to be honest, I think it'll be kind of a wash special teams. I don't really see much happening. Okay. All right. Well, that was a great tease pump, by you. Pump fake, pump fake. Yep. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, look, for me, offensively, the pass game is going to be important. So you could go Avery because he's the quarterback. You could go Jace Brown because he's a big receiver um, or, you know, any of those guys stepping up. But I think like this gets back down to if DJ Gins can go out and just continue to be the stud that he is, that's so impactful in this game because West Virginia thinks that their best avenue would be K-State running the ball against them because they know that they, they can get shredded through the air. Um, it, DJ Gins, I think, is so good that it doesn't matter what a defense is good or bad at. K-State can kind of just dominate them with that run game. And so I think DJ Gins is important because if you can do that, then it's also going to make life easier when you do have to throw the ball. Um, I think it. I think he's just in a position right now where he's doing a lot of good for K-State, and uh, I expect him to kind of carry the load. And again, in this, in a road game like this, you need somebody to be a star for you that is one of your stars. And uh, I don't think it the anything about the moment gets to him. So I go DJ Giddens on this front. Then defensively, uh, you can go with either one of the Austins for me here, Austin Romaine or Austin Moore. But I think when we talk about Number one last week, the linebackers. I think if you watch the game, I, I think they were where they needed to be. I thought they did a pretty good job. They just, because of how Colorado plays, everything that took place from Colorado either got stopped in front of the linebackers because they ran the ball for one yard or they the ball was like 30 yards past where they could make a play because of how Colorado throws it. But in a game where the run game is important, especially the quarterback run game, with Garrett green, I think it's going to be important that your linebackers step up and they can kind of set the table for being disciplined, locking in, not giving extra yards and letting guys slip away. Um, so I think that the linebackers actually have a pretty big role in this game. And I'll go with Austin Moore because he's the more veteran player here. And I think it's going to be on him to kind of keep guys locked in and in the loop. But Austin Romaine could very easily be the biggest playmaker for the team because that's what he's been for the linebackers all season. I mean, right now, and this is without knowing in a grand way what everybody else is doing in the league, but I know like Oklahoma State's best linebackers have been hurt. Is K-State going to have a real case to have both of those guys on the all Big 12 first team? Well, Austin remained in who? Sorry. Austin Moore. See, I don't know if Austin Moore is playing at that kind of level, personally. But Austin Romain, you think, is there? I think he's in the conversation. I think Brendan Mott is certainly in the conversation. I think DJ Giddens is in the conversation. If Jace Brown continues this clip, maybe he gets into the conversation. And then fans said this on our message board at KSO, and he's right. If you have a, if your running game is averaging almost seven yards a carry, you almost need to have an offensive lineman probably represent you on the All Big Twelve team too. And when you think about that, you're probably going maybe Easton Kilty or Sam Hecht if it's. When it, literally, if it's really all about performance, but obviously Adley Panzer probably has the most name recognition. Yeah. Uh, all right. Time for your prediction, how the game plays out, and then the final score attached to it. Again, I think West Virginia plays out of their mind. I think Kansas State's maybe not as sharp because of that sandwich spot that I really don't like where that teams get into. Talking about between Colorado and Kansas games, but somehow, some way late, kind of like a Colorado, the playmakers make a play and Kansas State finds a way to win 27, 23. All right. Uh, I'm going a little higher scoring than you um, because I, I just, I don't know. I, well, I don't know that I want to do that. I, I'll say this. I think K-State is able to have the defense be trustworthy enough. And I think the offense is going to continue to move the ball. I, the offense really shouldn't be a big concern to anybody anymore. I think they've proven themselves. Now they still have situational moments where they need to be better and it can get a little bit dicey. Um, teams have not scored at the highest of levels against West Virginia, even when they won. Um, I mean, you look at Iowa state last week, it was 28 to 16. I will go with K-State 31 and West Virginia 24. Um, I think it stays in that in that neighborhood. That's right, right on the number, the total yeah. 55. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. And I I thought about going higher than that. Um, and because K-State really hasn't been kicking field goals all that much in certain games. But I think in this one, you may settle for one at one point and you realize that. It, 
you're going to have a little bit more room for error uh, against West Virginia than you did against Colorado or, you know, other games at different points this year. So we'll see how it goes, but K-State and West Virginia this weekend, how it plays out in Morgantown. D.Y. and Drew will be headed out there on Friday, and uh, they'll be there Saturday for the Cats and Mountaineers. And then we'll be back and do it all over again on Monday, preparing for the Sunflower Showdown. Also a reminder that next week, Big 12 Basketball Media Days on Wednesday, so we will have that going on. And uh, in the buildup and post game of West Virginia, plenty of coverage over at On3. So go to kstateonline.com, get your coverage there. Make sure you're subscribed on KSO and also right here on the KSO YouTube. And uh, any other thoughts before we bail out of this preview show, DY? You said it all. All right. We are done. For Derek Young, I'm Mason Both Thanks for watching and listening to the KSO Show. We are back again Saturday after the game, recapping the Cats and Mountaineers.